Hey, pushers, Dr. Killer here. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Eisenhower administration, otherwise known as Ike, a um, very popular president from the 1950s. Baby boomers look back on him with great affection um, you know, from their childhood in the 1950s. So let's talk about how it happened. In 52, the Democrats, Truman's not running again. Uh, they nominate a guy named Adlai Stevenson. Republicans go with Eisenhower because he's a popular war hero. He appoints for uh, his vice president a guy named Richard Nixon, who's famous uh, for his work in the House Un-American Activities Committee rounding up communists or suspected communists. Um, this is his uh, first effort at becoming a, a national politician. And uh, he is he is Ike's you know political guy. Ike's not a politician. He has um, Nixon there to be his anti-communist credit. You know, people love that sort of thing. Um, here you got uh, the, one of the first TV commercials used in a political campaign, and it's very, very effective. It's very famous. Uh, check it out. It's worth seeing. It's kind of cute. Uh, that's Ike and Richard Nixon, um, you know, after they'd won at the National Convention, I'm sorry, at the Republican National Convention, taking the nomination. But before they got there, uh, Nixon almost did not get the nomination uh, for vice president because there was a scandal where he was accused of being uh, corrupt. Um, so rather than accept the, the Republican National Committee kicking him off the ticket, he appealed to the Republican people in America via the te uh, television. He goes on, on, on air and gives a half hour speech uh, trying to convince the American people to keep him on the ticket. And it's called the checker speech because he uses the story about his dog that he'd gotten from um, some constituent. That's one of the bribes he's accused of. Um, and he says, you know, he talks about his dog and how he's going to keep the dog. And it's very touching, actually. When you watch the video, you almost cringe when you realize what a, what a crook Nixon turns out to be. And you hear some of the things he says, it, it's irony. It's just, it's irony. Check it out. It's a good speech. Everyone should watch it once. All right, so uh, they do win the election. Look at the electoral votes. Uh, Stevenson gets his rear end handed to him by uh, Ike. Didn't go well. Here's your checker speech. There's checkers. Very cute little Cocker Spaniel dog. Um, here's the electoral uh, map from 1952. Notice the South here is still pretty solidly Democratic. Uh, remember, Truman begins to upset that by making civil rights an issue. Apparently, Stevenson did not make civil rights an issue. So the white Southerners are still voting Democratic. A lot of them just can't bring themselves to vote for a Republican yet. But that's changing. All right, so uh, Eisenhower, uh, one of the first things he does is he pledges to end the Korean War. He visits Korea. He does end the war. Um, but a lot of Americans are, are dissatisfied with the war. Um, it's called the Forgotten War because Americans lose over 30,000 people. We spend billions and billions of dollars, and what do we get for it? In the end, the war ends at the same place it began, the 38th parallel. There's no real you know, benefit for what the cost we put into it. Um, now, again, our policy at the time was to contain communism. We did contain it. But for most Americans, you know, spending that kind of money and losing those kind of lives isn't worth containing anything. Uh, here's some veterans of the Korean War. So uh, Ike, again, he's very popular. He's a middle-of-the-road guy. He's not upsetting anything. He, he's... he's he believes in the 1950s that Americans should enjoy their prosperity. We just ended World War II. We just had a Great Depression. Uh, he says, you know, hey, folks, let's not rock any boats. Let's just enjoy our prosperity and have a good time. And so he spends his time mostly playing golf. He's much like uh, Calvin Coolidge in the 1920s. You know, let the economy run itself. I'm just going to do my thing and stay out of the way. And he does that for the most part. His biggest criticism by doing this is, though, he, he has so much popularity. He has, he has political clout, and he doesn't use it. He doesn't use it to fix civil rights. He doesn't use it to go after McCarthy. He basically doesn't do anything as president. And uh, some people say, hey, you, you had an opportunity to do some amazing things, and you didn't. He believes in this thing called dynamic conservatism, which is basically he believes that we should be liberal towards people, civil rights and things like that, although he wasn't liberal towards African Americans. Um, but we should also be very conservative when it comes to money. Um, Honestly, he was neither of those. Again, he didn't really support the African Americans. And when it comes to money, he balloons the defense spending at this time period. The only thing that saves him from running up a massive debts is that the economy is doing so well in the 1950s that we're producing more. So we don't have the problem of massive debts like Reagan. When Reagan spends lots of money in defense, he runs up a debt because we don't have the economy in the 1980s that we had in the 1950s. All right. So, um, yeah, that's Ike. Um, okay, so immigration. During World War II, we had uh, a need for immigrants to come into the country and pick crops for the war effort. Uh, when the war is over, we don't need them anymore, and Ike starts to round them up and send them back to Mexico in an operation called Operation Wetback. Who names these things? That tells you almost everything you need to know about the 1950s. Operation Wetback. 
Um, he also believes Ike wanted to basically go back to the way we treated uh, Native Americans before FDR got rid of the uh, Dawes Severality Act and we gave them back their identities. Nick, uh, Eisenhower wants to take that away. I have no idea why. That was a dumb idea and luckily it died uh, and did not happen. Um, here's an example of somebody being deported. Probably the most significant uh, legislation passed during the 1950s is the Federal Highway Act of 1956. It put millions of people to work. It uh, created uh, thousands of miles of highway. It connected suburbs to cities, state to state, uh, but it was also a defense uh, um, issue. Right? One out of every five miles of the highway had to be straight so that our airplanes could land on it should the Soviets attack our air bases around the country. Uh, the bridges had to be 14 feet high so it could allow for our, uh, our missile systems to be transported on the highways back and forth. So it was more than just a civilian um, uh, construction project. It had military applications as well. Uh, but it did. It connected, it connected cities and suburbs. It allowed whites to move out of the cities, which again concentrated minorities in the cities and created lots of problems later on down the road. But in the 1950s, we didn't care about that. Um, foreign policy. We want to get rid of the containment policy in the 1950s. Uh, Ike's foreign, uh, or Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, wants to be more aggressive. He comes up with this idea of, um, um, uh, what's it called? Brinkmanship. Uh, and brink brinkmanship means that uh, basically we bully people into getting what we want. So if, if we want something, we tell them we want it. If they don't want to give it to us, we threaten nuclear war on them. The problem with brinkmanship is if the other person doesn't back down, you either have to nuke them or you back down and look weak. So it's really a stupid idea. But America in the 1950s, we think, you know, nobody can stop us. We're number one. We won World War II. We got nukes. What are you going to do? Um, so we tried that for a little bit. It doesn't really work. Um, so, yeah, that's John Foster Dulles's brinkmanship. Uh, not a smart move. Uh, there's our boy Charlton Heston in Moses. Good movie. Check it out sometime. Um, here's some examples of uh, our foreign policy not necessarily working out the way we want. After, World War, after Stalin dies in 1955, Ike tries to thaw out the Cold War. That's a good idea. Um, he proposes an idea called Open Skies, where we would be allowed to fly our planes over the Soviet Union. They would be able to fly their planes over us, take, take pictures, make sure we're not building any you know, secret weapons or whatever, spy on us, basically. The Soviets don't go for it. The Open Skies Treaty eventually gets passed, not under, not under Ike and not under Khrushchev. Um, but Trump just this week announced that we are backing out of the Open Skies uh, Treaty, which I don't know what that means necessarily because we don't use planes anymore to do it. We use satellites. How are you going to stop the Soviets or the Russians in this case from having satellites over us? I don't, I don't think you can do that. So whatever. I don't know what it means. Um, one of the examples where our foreign policy really didn't work was in Hungary. Uh, the Hungarian people, after being told by the United States that we will support anybody who tries to overthrow their communist government, thanks to John Foster Dulles, the Hungarian people rise up and try to overthrow the Soviets. And when they get on the radio and start asking for American help, hey, you know, we've overthrown the Soviets. Come help us before they counterattack. We did nothing, and the Soviets counterattacked it. They counterattacked. And they shot up uh, the resistance and killed them all. I've been to Budapest. If you go to Budapest today, in the center of the town, there are stone buildings all around the main square that are full of bullet holes that are still there today from the 1956 uprising when Ike and America did nothing to help these people after encouraging them to rise up in the first place. Not a good moment for us. Vietnam's also kicking off, just as Korea ends. Uh, the French in Vietnam, Indochina at the time, are uh, trying to recolonize the Vietnamese people. They don't like it. Um, they appeal to us for help. We say, we're not helping you. We're friends with the French. We're not going to help the Vietnamese. So the Vietnamese end up fighting the French on their own. The Vietnamese are very successful at this. And in 1954, at a place called Dien Bien Phu, they are able to, to, to defeat the French and uh, get rid of the French. So they have a peace conference in uh, Geneva. And at this peace conference, uh, the world decides that they're going to divide Vietnam between north and south at the 17th parallel because it worked so well in Korea. Let's do it again. So they divide it. Uh, the north is run by a guy named Ho Chi Minh. The south is run by a guy named No Dinh Diem. We support No, uh, who is a horrible person, a terrible dictator, very corrupt, but we support him. Go no figure. This is America's foreign policy in the 1950s. We do it a lot. Um, eventually, uh, Ike doesn't want to really get involved there by sending lots of troops. We just send lots of money um, because we're afraid that, that if Vietnam falls, everyone around them will fall. It's called the domino theory. We'll get into that in Vietnam. Um, another example of American foreign policy uh, going awry. We're, we want to make sure we have cheap oil uh, because even though America had, had been the majority, uh, the biggest producer of oil 
by the 19, late 50s, we are now the biggest consumer of oil, um, and we import it. So uh, we, need, we need access to cheap oil. Uh, Iran, which had a democratically elected government, began to uh, nationalize its oil industries. In other words, take them back from the companies, the, the private companies that own them, mostly American private companies. And when they did that, we didn't like that. So the CIA conducted a coup in Iran to overthrow the democratically elected government in Iran and impose a dictator on them. Uh, the guy eventually becomes known as the Shah. Let's forget his name that's on there. Just go with the Shah. The Shah is a dictator. He's a cruel person. He tortures their people. He's awful. And so for 30 years, the Iranian people have to live under this dictator that we support. And you wonder why they don't like us today. It's not a real shock. America's foreign policy hasn't always been very farsighted. Um, another example of our foreign policy. Uh, so in Egypt, uh, a guy named uh, Nasser that we supported, uh, we were helping him uh, with a, build a dam in his country, the Aswan High Dam. Um, eventually, we, we discovered that he's using the money we're giving him to, buy, to build the dam to buy weapons from the Soviet Union. We don't like that. So we withdraw our support. Nasser nationalizes the Suez Canal, which is a big deal because our oil tra uh, gets transported through that canal. England and France decide to invade Egypt, which we didn't want that to happen either. We eventually get everything to calm down by threatening Europe uh, with, by not giving them the oil we give them. So they back down. We settle the whole thing, and uh, it kind of goes away. But there's Nasser going through a big parade in Egypt, having a good day. Um, all right, so another example. Um, so back to Suez, Suez, I'm sorry. One of the things that the Middle East learned out of this is to try to basically fight America's ability to uh, bully uh, other countries with our oil. So they basically form a, a monopoly, a trust, uh, of oil-producing oil countries uh, called OPEC. Um, OPEC is around today. It, it's still very powerful, and it's very effective in, uh, in controlling the price of oil. Uh, although right now it's kind of a mess, but uh, in the past it's done very well. Um, okay, so Ike gets reelected in 1956 uh, by a bigger margin than he had the first time. Uh, Adelaide Stevenson, what were you thinking, running twice? Oh my God! So uh, 1950s again, unions are a big deal. Uh, corruption in unions are a big deal. Jimmy Hoffa, good movie by the way. Um, he's famous. He's not disappearing yet, but he's he's corrupt in the 1950s. One of the biggest events that happens in the 50s is this uh, Sputnik. So we always believed we had a nuclear arms race with the Soviets, but we always believed that we were better than them. We had bigger rockets. We had you know, better technology. We were always going to be ahead of them, so it's no big deal. In 1957, the Soviets launched the first satellite in space, which scared the bejesus out of us because all of a sudden they had a technological advance, uh, advantage over us. We thought, oh, my God, they're going to be raining down nukes on us from space, and we can't stop them. It just it caused a big kerfluffle in America. Um, and again, it's called Sputnik. Basically, Sputnik's little satellite, all it does is go beep, beep, beep as it goes around the Earth. That's all it did, but it, it mattered a lot. Uh, we basically redid our educational system in America to put more focus on math and science. The federal government got involved in funding education in America, which it had never done before that. Um, so that all begins in 1957. So, yeah, National Defense and Education Act, NDEA, is the beginning of the federal government getting involved in education. So, uh, great movie here if you get a chance to watch it. It's called October Sky. It's about Sputnik, uh, famous actors you'll see in it. It's pretty good. Um, all right, so, again, uh, we still have problems uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, in 1959, we, we offer, offer the idea of having a summit to try and cool off again the Cold War a little bit or thaw it out a little bit, um, and everything looks good. We have, we have uh, Nixon uh, meets Khrushchev and what's called the, the kitchen debate where they talk about technology and consumer. We say, look, we've got an advantage over you with consumer goods. You've got an advantage with rockets. So, you know, it's kind of even. Anyway, um, this, this uh, um, uh, meeting never really happened, though, because right before the meeting, uh, the Soviets had accused us of spying on them. And we said, we don't spy on you. That's something the Soviets do. And then as we say that, they shot down the U-2 spy plane that was spying on them, and it, it just crashed the whole conference that they were going to have and ended peace. Um, we also ended up having a, um, a coup in Guatemala to support an American-backed dictator down there. We do this a lot of the time. Uh, Cuba has a problem where uh, we had supported a dictator there as well. Uh, but in Cuba, their dictator is overthrown by a guy named Castro, uh, and you know how that ends, right? Castro is not our friend um, and still causing problems today. Also, here's a good movie. I have a couple of good movies here at the end and a question for you to answer. Um, and that's about all the time I have. So I got to say goodbye, gang. Thank you very much.